Hello and welcome to India Business Hour. I'm Shireen Bhan. The headlines that we're tracking for you this evening. Indian equities fall for the fifth session in a row as the broader market sell-off deepens, tracking weak quarterly earnings. Friday's dive as the market's ending lower for the fourth week running. That's the longest losing streak since August 2023. Indian and Chinese troops begin disengagement at two friction points in the eastern Ladakh sector. Defence officials indicate Indian troops have started to pull back equipment to rare locations in these areas. It's the first thaw in the Indo-Chinese relations along the border in four years. Indigo swings into the red for the first time in two years as higher fuel bill and hike in maintenance costs takes a toll. Post the loss of 987 crore rupees, operational expenses rise 22% on a yearly basis, outpacing the 13% hike in revenue. The Supreme Court has its eyes set on a fully integrated data center for its IT needs, is in talks with tech giant NVIDIA for the possible supply of GPUs for its data center. A top Supreme Court official tells CNBC TV 18 the Apex Court is looking to deploy AI for transcription and translation of live court proceedings. India is no more a pushover, but we don't negotiate today from a position of weakness. Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal insists India and the European Union need to be more cognizant of each other's sensitivities to enable a free trade deal, reiterates India's stance that the agreement must focus on trade-related issues rather than aspects of the environment which are the domain of the UN. Premiumization is driving the FMCG sector, currently reeling from a demand slowdown. A Nielsen IQ report highlights that the premiumization trend is responsible for half of the incremental sales of the industry, adding that the luxury basket within the FNCG sector is the fastest growing category. The Lebanon government claims three journalists have been killed in an Israeli airstrike on a guest house in southern Lebanon, calls it a war crime. Israel says five soldiers were killed in fighting in southern Lebanon. Hectic parlays over seat sharing continue in Maharashtra. BJP's Devendra Fadnavis says the ruling coalition have a consensus on 278 seats. Eknath Shinde, Shiv Sena, fields Rajya Sabha MP Milin Diora against Aditya Thakre in Verli. Over 30 million voters cast an early ballot in the United States ahead of the November 5th poll. CNBC's All-American survey points to a dead heat, even though Trump holds a slender lead over Harris. Elon Musk's wealth soared to $33 billion after shares of Tesla surge over strong third quarter results. The latest rally puts Musk's net worth over $270 billion. Well, let's start with the market action where the loss is mounted on the Lal Street today. The Nifty and the Sensex have seen cuts of nearly a percent each as markets remained under pressure, tracking weak Q2 numbers. Mid-caps took it harder today with that index losing almost 2%. So that's the mid-cap index for you. And with this, the markets have fallen for five days in a row and 20 lakh crore rupees of investor wealth has now been wiped out in this period. Friday's plunge means that the markets have lost ground for the fourth straight week, making this the longest weekly decline that we've seen since August of last year. A quick check of the India FPI counter now. Foreign portfolio investors have net sold equities worth $10 billion in October so far. China, meanwhile, continues to see an inflow of FPI capital for the fifth consecutive week. FPIs have net bought Chinese equities worth $19 billion cumulatively in the last week of September and October so far. So that's how the data stacks up on FPI. On to earnings, and this is what is worrying the markets. Indigo, India's largest and only profitable airline thus far, has flown into the red after two years, hit by rising fuel costs and higher expenditure towards maintenance. The airline has reported a net loss of over 980 crore rupees for the second quarter. Vinny Motiwala joins us now with more details. Vinny, the street was expecting the airline to report a loss this quarter, but this number is a lot more or a lot higher than what was estimated. Absolutely, losses that we're seeing coming in after eight quarters, though the expectation was also of a loss, but we were expecting somewhere around a 194 crore loss. But this 988 crore loss is much sharper than what we were expecting in terms of a loss. Yeah, last year, obviously, they were reporting a profit. So that is one thing that is surely negative. Yes, grounding of aircrafts, that's something that is hurting the, uh, the company. Other than that, in terms of when you look at the Forex loss, that's at around 2,460 crores this time. So that also does impact in terms of the loss figure. 
but yes, a sharper number in terms of a loss that we're seeing. Revenue growth, not much of an excitement there, 13.5% growth. Do not forget that Q2 generally is a weak quarter for airlines and for Indigo as well. So that is something that does come into impact and play over here. When you're looking at the passenger yield, that is coming in line with what we're expecting. Rupees 4.5 per kilometers is what we're looking at. Last year it was 4.44. So slight bit of an increase at least in terms of the yields. And margins are coming in in line with what we were expecting at CNBC TV18. EBITDA margin at 14.3 percent versus uh, I beg your pardon 14.3 percent versus 14 percent so almost in line with the expectation of the street as well as CNBC was expecting EBITDA also coming in at 2434 crores which is slight bit better than what we were expecting so yes when you're looking at it in terms of margins surely it is decent but the loss is something that one should be concerned about because after seven quarters the company has actually reported a loss Many, many thanks. That's Indigo. And let's stay with earnings. JSW Steel reporting an 85% drop in net profit in Q2. This on the back of a one-time loss of 342 crore rupees from the surrender of a mining lease. While domestic sales have remained strong, exports down 43% year-on-year. The company attributed this to increased Chinese exports, which have adversely impacted global markets. Bank of Baroda, meanwhile, has reported a strong set of numbers. Its net profit jumped 23% in Q2, helped by a 7% growth in net interest income. The bank's asset quality has also improved, with gross NPAs falling over 80 basis points to 2.5%. The bank has, however, lowered its credit growth guidance to between 11 and 13% for the fiscal to calibrate it with the lower deposit growth in the banking system. And it's also lowered its deposit growth guidance from the earlier 10 to 11% to 9 to 11%. Well, real estate giant DLF has had a stellar quarter, consolidated net profit more than doubling to over 1380 crore rupees, helped by a 47% jump in revenue and a surge in other income. It's also been aided by a reversal of deferred tax liabilities to the tune of 605 crore rupees. So that's good news there for DLF. Now, both Bank of Baroda and DLF reporting results after market hours, so stock reactions will be seen on Monday. But traders have continued to punish stocks of companies that have not delivered as per expectations. Indus in Bank, one such example, the stock plunging over 18% today after it reported a weak set of numbers, making this the worst performing stock on the bosses for the day. It reported that net profits were down 40% to 1,325 crore rupees on an annual basis, while asset quality deteriorated on a sequential basis. Poonawala Fincorp, another example, that stock down over 17% after reporting a net loss of over 470 crore rupees, despite a 34% rise in revenue and a 17% rise in net interest income. The companies blamed the loss on a one-time operating expenditure and ongoing investments in technology. However, its gross NPA ratio rose to 2.1% from 0.67% in the previous quarter on the back of slippages in its short-term personal loan portfolio. In the IPO market, investors have given a lukewarm welcome to AFCON's infrastructure. At the end of day one, applications have come in for just 10% of the 5,400 crore rupee issue from the Shapurji Palanji Group's flagship company. Here's how the numbers stack up. Applications have come in for 16% of the portion reserved for non-institutional investors, 14% of the retail portion and 38% of the portion reserved for employees. Well, and let's now tell you about the big story in uh, National news, the first signs of a thaw in Indo-Chinese relations along the line of actual control in Ladakh may soon be visible. We learn from sources that both India and China have begun the disengagement process at Depsang and Demchok in eastern Ladakh. Remember, these were the two last friction areas along the line of actual control. Parikshit is standing by now with the details. Parikshit, what does this now mean for the two countries? Well, uh, we have been told by sources in the army that disengagement in Depsang and Demchok began on Tuesday. These were the only remaining friction points where disengagement was yet to take place in eastern Ladakh. Now, the troops have started moving back and uh, the aim, as per the agreement, is to move to locations that existed uh, before April 2020. So they're talking about status quo. Now, whether that happens, uh, that remains to be seen, but there will be regular commander-level talks, confidence-building measures to ensure the agreement is implemented. Does this mean that the troops will be reduced on either side? No. That will mean de-escalation and de-induction, and that will really be the proof of the pudding. When will that take place? When there is confidence that disengagement has been successful, uh, there is a certain amount of trust in the, uh, uh, in the conversation lines between uh, the two countries, 
that is perhaps when we will see the troop numbers getting re reduced as well. But for the moment, the idea is to move back to the April, pre-April 2020 uh, locations by the 28th or 29th of October. All right, Parikshit, many thanks for joining us. And speaking of international news, Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal insists that India and the European Union have to be more cognizant of each other's sensitivities if they are to work faster towards a free trade agreement. Goyal was speaking at the 18th Asia-Pacific Conference of German Business. He reiterated India's stance that the agreement needed to focus on trade-related issues rather than extraneous aspects like labor or climate change. He also said there would be no pact if the EU insisted on opening up the dairy sector in India. First, the sensitivities between the two, your 27 countries and my 27 states collectively as the Union of India, if we respect each other's sensitivities, with Australia, with UAE, with EFTA, the very first decision we took was we'll respect each other's sensitivities and not encroach on uh, issues which can hurt. moment we decided that a lot of, for example, daily, I just can't open up daily. If the European Union insists that I open up daily, there's no FTA. That's the Commerce Minister there. Back to business news. SpiceJet has said the company has settled a 4.5 million dispute with lesser Shannon engine support for an aggregate sum of $2 million. SpiceJet in a statement said both parties reached this agreement via amicable negotiations and chose to resolve the matter outside the courtroom. Now, the Supreme Court has set its eyes on a fully integrated data center for its IT needs. The top court is set to be in talks with tech giant NVIDIA for a possible supply of GPUs for its data center. A top Supreme Court official told CNBC TV18's Ashmit Kumar that the Apex Court is looking to adopt AI for transcription of live court proceedings. And remember, live court proceedings not just from court number one, but across the 17 courts of the Supreme Court expected to be streamed. Now, the European Investment Bank has committed external funding of nearly 300 million euros for the Bengaluru Suburban Railway project. Speaking to Pariksit Lutra, the bank's vice president, Nicola Beer, also said that annual investments of nearly 500 million euros will continue into India as the country offers more opportunities in green energy and urbanization. India is a very important partner for us, but this time we have three key priorities. The first is the announcement of a big investment, 300 million for the Bengaluru suburban railway um, system um, to invest it uh, in good traffic. Um, the second is um, the formal launch of our urban mobility competence hub, which we are installing here uh, with our partner DB Engineering. Now, premiumization has been the big growth driver for the FMCG space. Despite the overall slowdown in the sector, Nielsen IQ report highlights that premium brands continue to see double-digit growth compared to their non-premium peers. The report also suggests that premium FMCG and tech durables have attracted higher consumer focus. Factors like high income levels, urbanization and smartphone penetration are driving this growth. President Draupadi Murmu has appointed Justice Sanjeev Khanna as India's next Chief Justice. He will succeed Chief Justice Diva Chandachur, who is due to retire on the 10th of November, but he will have a short stint of just six months. Ashwin joins us now to take us through uh, CGI Chandachur uh, to hand over the baton to Justice Khanna next month. Give us a timeline of Justice Khanna's legal career so far, Rashmit. Handing over the baton from the CGI to the CGI in waiting has been completed. Justice Khanna is set to take over as India's 51st Chief Justice of India. The announcement came late last evening with the Law Minister Arjun Ram Meghwal tweeting out that the President has appointed Justice Sanjeev Khanna as the next CGI. So here's how the timeline will pan out. Justice Diva Chandrachur will retire officially on November 10th, but 10th is a Sunday, so his last working day will be November 8th. Justice Khanna will then be sworn in on November 11th as the 51st CGI. He'll have a brief term of six months. Justice Khanna is set to retire on May 13th, 2025. Now, speaking of Justice Sanjeev Khanna, he began his journey as an advocate in 1983. He argued in Delhi's District Court of the Sazari as well as the Delhi High Court. He argued cases of taxation, arbitration, commercial law and environment law. After his stint as a lawyer, he was appointed as an additional judge of the Delhi High Court in 2004 and subsequently made permanent the following year. 
In 2019 came the big surprise when Justice Khanna had been elevated to the highest court of the country. It led to many raised eyebrows. Justice Khanna had found favour with the Collegium, even though there were 33 judges across various high courts who were higher in seniority. What made this elevation even more interesting is that Justice Khanna had never been the Chief Justice of any high court. But he was right in the thick of things from his very first year in the Supreme Court. In November of 2019, Justice Khanna led bench decided a landmark case holding that even the Chief Justice of India is subject to the RTI. He held that the RTI does not compromise the independence of the judiciary. In January of 2021, with the Central Vista redevelopment in the national capital facing legal challenges in the top court, Justice Khanna had dissented with the majority judgment that allowed Central Vista project to continue. He had opined that there were procedural illegalities and failure to abide by the statutory provisions and mandate. In October of 2023, Justice Khanna had refused bail to Manish Sisodia, but had allowed him to revive the bail application in case the trial gets delayed. Turns out the trial in fact was delayed and Justice Khanna's order became the basis of Sisodia's release. In December of 2023, Justice Khanna was a part of a five-judge bench that upheld the abrogation of Article 370, taking away the special status that had been granted to JNK. In February of 2024, Justice Khanna was a part of one of the biggest rulings coming out of the Supreme Court in 2024. Just a few months ahead of the 2024 Lok Sabha elections, Justice Khanna, as a part of this five-judge bench, struck down electoral bonds. Justice Khanna held that the right to know is paramount for free and fair elections and democracy. In April 2024, Justice Khanna led bench rejected a plea seeking 100% VVPAT EVM verification. He held that the fears regarding EVMs were unfounded. And finally, in May of 2024, bang in the middle of the Lok Sabha elections, he granted bail to Arvind Kejriwal to campaign for the elections. He held that the general elections supply the vis viva to a democracy. Now, following close on the heels of Justice D.Y. Chandrachur's two-year term, Justice Khanna is likely to have his hands full. Ashwath many thanks. That is going to be the new Chief Justice of India, Justice Sanjeev Khanna. Up next on India Business Hour, Lebanon's government claims three journalists were killed in an Israeli airstrike on a guest house in southern Lebanon, calls it a war crime. That and more when we return. You can catch all of CNBC TV18's news and updates on Facebook, X, Threads, Instagram and Geo Cinema. At least one person has died in rain-related incidents in West Bengal as the state continues to remain on alert in the aftermath of Cyclone Dana. Heavy rains continue in Kolkata and several areas which have been waterlogged. Cyclone Dana completed its landfall process earlier this morning. On the Odisha coast, State Chief Minister Mohan Charan Maji said no deaths have been reported on account of it, adding that the zero casualty mission was successful. The Met has issued a red alert in Odisha and West Bengal and a yellow alert in Bihar, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu for today. Bomb threats to Indian Airlines continue. 27 flights have received hoax threats today. According to sources, seven flights each of Indigo, Vistara and Spicejet and six flights of Air India received messages sparking widespread concern. Yesterday, the Indian Airlines had reported 85 bomb threats and this nightmare continues. Meanwhile, the big ongoing geopolitical conflict is intensifying. A barrage of Israeli missiles pounded southern suburbs of Beirut overnight. The Lebanese government says three journalists covering the war were killed in a targeted strike in southern Lebanon. It's called the attack a war crime. Journalists who have died worked for two pan-Arab news broadcasters. Meanwhile, Israeli forces have claimed that five soldiers were killed while fighting in south Lebanon in separate action. Iran-backed militant group Hezbollah has fired dozens of rockets towards northern Israel. Israeli defense forces claim that around 50 rockets were identified and partially intercepted by its air defense systems. The situation in northern Gaza has also worsened. Nearly 150 people are feared trapped in a hospital which was hit by intense shelling by the Israeli military. Well, now moving on to news coming in from other parts of the country and the world. We are focusing on the U.S. presidential elections. With less than two weeks to go for Election Day, more than 30 million Americans have already cast their votes early. A new survey by CNBC shows that the contest between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump remains a statistical dead heat. Inflation is the top concern, with three-fourths of the respondents saying that prices are still rising. Meanwhile, candidates are busy campaigning in swing states. U.S. Vice President and Democratic candidate Kamala Harris shared the stage with former President Barack Obama for the first time at a rally in Georgia, Harris urging voters to 
consider the brutally serious consequences of a Trump victory. Obama referred to Trump as dangerous. The rally was a star-studded one with rock legend Bruce Springsteen and entertainer Tyler Perry also campaigning for Harris. And speaking of the U.S. elections, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump campaigned in Nevada last evening. Speaking at the rally, Trump said he's leading the political movement in the country's history. He also promised voters to tackle inflation and crack down on undocumented immigrants in the state. And CNBC TV 18 contributor Malvika Jain spoke to U.S. Assistant Secretary of Commerce Arun Venkatraman about what the elections could potentially mean for U.S.-India ties. He said the commercial relationship between both countries will continue to grow irrespective of who is in office. The U.S.-India commercial relationship has been on a solid upward trajectory for decades now. Uh, and that trajectory is only going further upwards. Uh, this is not a question of elections. This is frankly a question of the shared interests that we have and the tremendous synergies we have between our commercial sectors where American solutions uh, can partner with uh, Indian companies to bring technologies to India and vice versa, to bring Indian investments into the United States. That trend is bound to continue no matter what because the interests are the same. Elon Musk's wealth has soared to $33 billion after shares of Tesla surged over strong third quarter results. The latest rally puts Musk's net worth over $270 billion. Now, Amazon is all set to deliver the future, but what does it mean? Does it mean greater deployment of AI? Does it mean faster delivery speeds? And what about the challenge from quick commerce? Ashmit traveled to Nashville to find some answers. Take a look. Well, I'm coming to you from the music city of Nashville, Tennessee, USA, and there's clearly a new gig in town by the name of Amazon delivering the future. This is the flagship event uh, for the retail side of operations for Amazon, what they call our Amazon stores. And clearly there was a fair bait and store in terms of the big announcements that were made. Uh, we'll take you through them one by one, but first focusing on the few that could trickle down to the Indian market, uh, chief amongst them being the announcement on an AI-backed shopping guide. Now, what exactly is it? How does it work and how will it assist the shoppers in making that shopping experience more intuitive? One of the things that, that I find very helpful with AI shopping guides is that if when I'm shopping in a category that I may not either shop in very frequently or I don't know a lot about, um, and I'll use televisions as, a, as an example, um, it, it does a few things for me. One is it actually tells me what I should be thinking about. Um, so if I'm buying a TV, should I be thinking about the screen size? Should I be thinking about what technology, like OLED versus QLED? Should I be thinking about where is this TV going to go in my house? Am I gonna put it like in a, in like a common area or in a bedroom? Well, this is not the first time that Amazon has announced an AI-backed tool to assist customers, making their experiences more intuitive. They've previously launched an AI assistant, shopping assistant by the name of Rufus. Uh, they've also talked about introducing AI tech that will enable summaries of customer reviews for individual products. The question, however, that we ask the leadership is that when will we see this in India? We, um, all of these features over time will roll out to, 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 uh, to all marketplaces, including India. Uh, when I look at, like, for instance, with Rufus, which recently launched in India, and it's available now, I believe, to all customers in India, um, you know, what we're finding very quickly is, like, you know, what are customers doing with it and how is it helping them uh, shop? Um, and right now, it being kind of the festive season in, in India, we're actually seeing customers using Rufus to actually find deals on Amazon and making it easier to find those deals. But another big takeaway is the focus area that has been spelled out by the leadership, which is increasing the speed of delivery, saying that it's good for business. Our investment in new innovations has never been larger. And given the AI transformation that we're going through, the breadth of innovation across our teams has never been broader. And so uh, I'm really excited about it. It's a bit of the reason why you see this Cambrian explosion of AI innovations going on across the, across the teams and across the companies. Um, so as a, as a builder, uh, I still feel like Amazon is just a giant startup factory. Uh, as an owner, I feel pretty good about our capabilities. I think our mechanisms and our culture are really well suited for this period of time and going through this technical change. Well, is this need for speed indicative of Amazon the giant taking note of the challenge that has been issued by Quick Commerce, the new kid on the block? And what does it mean for a competitive e-commerce market like India? We tend to spend a lot of our time on obsessing about customers, not obsessing about uh, competition, but we're definitely inspired by all the various alternatives our members in India have. Uh, I think the important thing to remember is that uh, the prime proposition is predicated on 
the largest selection at the fastest speeds. Like I said before, we have over a million items available same day, a million items. Not 1,000 items, not 10,000 items, a million items available on your doorstep today. Four million items available across India next day. And so that breadth of selection uh, we see in India covers needs all the way to wants. Clearly, Amazon is promising the future at its flagship event called Delivering the Future. I'm leaving Nashville asking when these innovations will come to Indian shores. In Nashville, Tennessee, USA, with camera person Sarod Singh, Ashmit Kumar. Well, the e-commerce was. And with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of India Business Hour. From all of us here, thanks very much for watching. Do stay tuned. The news will continue on CNBC TV 18.